Chapter 11, Jamoka Jack. The stagecoach climbed as if it were part mountain goat. It lurched, it halted, it buckled, it leaped, and it clung. At times, there was a sheer drop to one side of the trail. Far below, the pine trees looked to Jack like sharp green lances waiting to skewer them if they slipped. He only looked once in a while. They were almost at the diggings, he told himself. He'd been telling himself that for days, but at last the stagecoach arrived, bringing a cloud of summer dust all the way from Sacramento City. Hang town, gents, the driver snapped with a final crack of his whip. Looks mighty quiet today. Don't see nobody standing under a pine limb with his boots off on the ground. A dog greeted them at the end of the street and barked them all the way up to the Empire Hotel. The passengers got out. There was road dust in Jack's eyebrows, in his ears, and down his neck. Now that they had arrived, he had gold fever so bad that he didn't see how he could wait another five minutes to get his shovel in the ground. Hang town! Everywhere he looked, there were men in jack boots and colored shirts. There wasn't a woman to be seen. The miners were coming and going, or standing and walking, or sitting and whittling. Blue freight wagons were being unloaded. Blindfolded mules were being loaded. The store shacks on both sides of the street were raised on wood pilings like short legs and looked as if they had just walked to town. Jack shouldered the shovel and praiseworthy shouldered the pick. On the roof of the stage, the driver was throwing down trunks and hand luggage. What's the best hotel in town? asked Praiseworthy. The Empire, answered the driver. What's the worst? squinted Cut-Eye Higgins. The Empire. Praiseworthy glanced at Jack. Unless I miss my guess, there's only one hotel in town, the Empire. It was exactly one hour and five minutes before Jack saw the diggings. First, Praiseworthy registered at the hotel. They washed. Immediately, Praiseworthy wrote a letter to Dr. Buckby, advising him that Cut Eye Higgins was in Hangtown, but that the map had fallen into the hands of a gang highwayman. Can we go now, said Jack, fidgeting. He had polished his spawn so much he could see his nose in it. Go where? The diggings. Oh, the diggings will be there after lunch, Master Jack. Praiseworthy's patience was a marvel and an exasperation. They had come more than 15,000 miles, and now they had to stop to eat. Jack didn't care if they passed up eating for a week, a month even. He wondered if he could ever grow up to be an e as easygoing as Praiseworthy. But once they sat down in the hotel restaurant, Jack discovered he was so hungry that he ordered bear steak. The only other item on the menu was sow belly and beans, and Jack figured he had to be starving to eat to order that. You and the boy want bread with your grub? asked the waiter. He was a big fellow in floppy boots. Why not? answered Praiseworthy. It's a dollar a slice. The, but the butler slowly arched an eyebrow. Two dollars with butter on it. Praiseworthy peered at Jack and then smiled. Hang the cost, sir. We're celebrating our arrival. Bread and butter, if you please. The bear steak was greasy and stringy, but something to write home about. Jack forced it down. After they left the restaurant, Praiseworthy bought a pair of buckskin pouches at the general merchandise store and emptied the gold dust out of his glove. The index finger was springing a leak. Jack liked the new leather smell of the pouch. He tucked it under his belt next to the horn spoon and was beginning to feel like a miner. Then, with tin wash basins under their arms and the pick and shovel across their shoulders, they set out for the diggings. The day was hot and sweaty. When they reached running water, they saw miners crouched everywhere along the banks. They were washing gold out of the dirt in everything from wooden bowls to frying pans. Anybody digging here? asked Praiseworthy when they came to a bare spot. Sure is, came the answer. That's Buffalo John's claim. The butler and the boy moved on upstream. Here and there, miners were shoveling dirt into long wooden troughs set in running water to catch the flakes of gold. Anybody digging here, asked Praiseworthy. Yep, came the answer. That's Jimmy from Town's claim. On and on they went, looking for a place to dig. They passed miners in blue shirts and red shirts and check shirts and some in no shirts at all. Picks assaulted the earth and shovels flew. Weathered tents were staked to the hillsides, and the smell of boiling coffee drifted through the air. 
After they had walked a mile and a half, Jack began to think they would never find a patch of ground that wasn't spoken for. Suddenly, a pistol shot cracked the mountain air. Praiseworthy's wash basin rang like a bell and leaped from his arm and went clattering away. You there, a voice from behind bellowed. Praiseworthy turned. His eyes narrowed slowly. Are you talking to me, sir? Talking and shooting. What are you doing with my wash pan under your arm? Jack stared at the man. He had a thick, tangled beard and his ears were bent over the, under the weight of his slouch hat. Needless to say, you're mistaken, Praiseworthy answered. Until this moment, I've had the good fortune never to set eyes on you or your wash pan, sir. We don't take kindly to thievery in these parts, growled the miner, stepping forward. A man steals around here, we lop off his ears. That's miner's law. Do you have laws against shooting at strangers? Nope. Jack couldn't imagine Praiseworthy with his ears lopped off. He took a grip on the handle of the shovel as the miner came closer. His heart beat a little faster, and he waited for a signal from Praiseworthy. The miner belted his pistol and picked up the wash pan. He crimped an eye and looked it over. It's mine, all right. You're either nearsighted or a scoundrel, said Praiseworthy. Jack was ready to fight, if not for their lives, at least for Praiseworthy's ears. Just then, a flash of tin in the sunlight from a pile of wet rocks caught Jack's eye. He dropped the shovel and went for it. Is this your pan, Jack said. The miner's bushy eyebrows shot up like birds, taking wing. It is at that, ain't it? And he laughed as if the joke were on him. I forget my boots if I didn't have them on. Praiseworthy peered at the man. Apparently, shooting at strangers by mistake didn't amount to anything in the diggings. The miner hardly gave it another thought. How about a cup of jamoka? Jamoka, said Praiseworthy. Coffee. I got a pot working on the fire. Where are you strangers from? Pitch Pine Billy Pierce, they call me, and I'd rightly be pleased if you did the same. Shucks, looks like I wore a hole plumb through your wash pan. Good shooting, though, weren't it? Praiseworthy put his finger through the hole. The wash pan was useless. Perfect shooting, sir. No hard feeling, said Pitch Pine Billy. I can show you more ways to wash gold than skin a cat. Let's get the coffee. Put hair on the boy's chest. He your son? Jack looked up at Praiseworthy. My son, the butler started to explain, but the miner didn't leave long enough pause. Mississippi McFinn has his two boys with him. I hear they just struck it rich over at Poverty Hill, and there's there's the Peterman boy. He and his paws trying their luck at swellhead diggins. What's your name, boy? Jack? You look powerful clean for a young un. It don't seem natural somehow. Why, your ears shine like new minted gold pieces. Jack felt his face redden, and he glanced at Praiseworthy. I'm not going to wash for a week, he thought, or a month, or maybe even until we get back to Boston. There was an air of hospitality about the miner that pleased Praiseworthy, and he forgave him the hole in his gold pan. Sir, a cup of coffee would taste fine. Pitch Pine Billy led them to his weathered canvas tent pitched along the slope. The coffee pot was boiling merrily. He filled three cans three tin cans, black. Black as paint, it looked to Jack. He had never tasted coffee in his life. Aunt Arabella would be furious. He looked at Praiseworthy, and Praiseworthy gave him a nod, as if to make up for having Jack wash his ears back at the hotel. The tin cans were so hot, they felt as they had just been forged. Jack sat on a rock to let the brew cool. Although Praiseworthy's coat and bowler hat had fallen by the wayside, he clung to the black umbrella as a last badge of his calling. A butler, a butler, mused Pitch Pine Billy. He drank his coffee down, steam and all. You any relative to Hemp Butler over at Mule Town? The name's Praiseworthy, not Butler, sir. The miner crimped an eye. You don't say. Well, he calls himself Butler, old Hemp does. Never knowed his, pra his name was Praiseworthy, but I always figured him for the shifty type. How about Ten Spot Butler over at Poker Flat? Here, folks, there seemed to be no point in trying to make himself clear, and praiseworthy let it go. Tell me, Mr. Pierce, just call me Pitch Pine Billy. How do we stake a claim? Easy. Find yourself a piece of real estate nobody's working and pound four pegs in the corners. Put tin cans on them so folks can see. Rags'll do, and you got yourself a legal claim. That's miner's law. As long as you work it at least one day a month, it stays yours. 
He laughed and stroked his beard. Of course, the other 30 days he got to stand around shooting off squatters and claim jumpers. He refilled his tin can. Why, there are places along the river where the claims is only four foot square and the boys is digging out a fortune back to back. Jack finally picked up his tin can. The steam alone was like a dragon's breath. Now he was almost sorry praiseworthy had given him a nod. At the first taste, the coffee bit his tongue. Drink up, Jack. Jamoka Jack, that's what we'll call you. A man ain't really accepted around here until he's won himself a nickname. Best coffee ever tasted, Jack said hoarsely. Plenty more in the pot. I ground in a few acorns for flavor. Jack winced inwardly. Jamoka Jack, the name pleased him, but he wasn't sure he could win it. The coffee stung and burned and taste poisonous. He forced down another mouthful. He was afraid the miner would take back the name if he didn't drain the can. He tried another swig, but it wouldn't go down. Praiseworthy, catching Jack's distress out of the corner of his eye, shifted his position. The tip of his umbrella jiggled Jack's elbow, and the tin can jumped. The coffee spilled. It's no account, said Pitchpine Billy. He lifted the pot and refilled Jack's can. We don't stand on table manners out here. Jack gulped and stared at the fresh, steaming black portion of coffee. He had to begin all over again. Praiseworthy gave him a compassionate glance. He considered it his duty to look out for Jack, but now he had only made matters worse. Let me show you how to wash out gold without water, Pitch Pine Billy was saying. Take your horn spoon, boy, and scrape me some dirt from the crack in that rock. It's spaces like that that the Spangles like to hide if there is any. Jack was glad to set the coffee aside to cool. He slipped the horn spoon from his belt and turned eagerly to the cracks in the crack in the rocks. Just a handful, boy. Jack scraped away, gathering up river sand and bits of dead pine needles. The horn spoon worked fine. It got in the cracks. He filled the miner's outstretched hand and sat on his heels to watch. This is a trick the Sonorans use, said Pitch Pine Billy. They came from Sonora down Mexico way. Water must be scarcer than gold around there. We call this dry washing. He poured the dirt in a small stream from fist to hand, like sand in an hourglass, while at the same time blowing on it. Sand and pine needles scattered under the force of his breath. He poured again and again, and each time the handful of dirt grew smaller. Grain for grain, gold is eight times heavier than sand. If you blow it just right, the spangles fall and the lighter stuff goes flying. Jack bent closer. Finally, Pitch Pine Billy had nothing left to blow. He held out the rough palm of his hand and laughed. Boy, you struck it rich already, look there. Resting in his hand were two gleaming pinheads of gold. But to Jack, they looked as large as jewels. Put him in your pouch, boy, said Pitch Pine Billy. Easy, don't knock over your coffee. Thank you, sir, Jack smiled, whipping out his brand new buckskin pouch. But they're yours, the miner grinned. Anything that small, I throw back in. You and your pa can squat on my claim. But praise where these not. There's more yellow underfoot than I can dig out. I'd be obliged if you clear some of it away. You got any idea how to work that tin pan of yours, boy? Mr. Quartz Jackson, you a friend of old Quartz. Why didn't you say so? Stay for dinner here. We'll have sow belly and beans. I won't take no for an answer here. Now let's get our boots wet and I'll learn you how to pan. Bring your coffee. Jack exchanged a glance with, Ms. with Praiseworthy. Sow belly and beans. We'd be, be delighted to join you for dinner, Praiseworthy said since Pitch Pine Billy had left them no choice. They moved to the edge of the stream, and Jack took a swallow of coffee. The miner pulled a few weeds and threw them in the pan. Jack got down another mouthful of coffee. A round run in water, explained Pitch Pine Billy. Gold has a way of getting tangled in the roots of weeds and grass. He dipped the water in the pan and washed the roots clean. He added more dirt until the wash basin was better than half full. Then he began to pan using the same circular mo motion Quartz Jackson had showed them. You get rid of the rocks and slickens little by little. Slickens, said Jack, mud with the gold worked out of it. Keep the pan working and dipping and working until the spangles reach bottom. Fish out the rocks. See how I'm letting the slickens spill over the edge of the pan? It takes practice, boy. 
At first, you'll lose more color over the side than you'll save in the bottom, but you'll get the hang of it. Ain't you drinking your coffee, boy? Why, look here. We struck it rich again. Let me have your pouch. Jack took two hard swallows of coffee. Then he pulled off his shoes, rolled up his trousers, and tried his hand with the gold pan. The mountain water was icy, but he hardly noticed it at first. He hunted grass and weeds. Five minutes later, he could no longer feel his feet. You're standing in melted snow off the high peaks, Pitch Pine Billy chuckled. Wash out enough color, and you can buy yourself some boots. Then he turned to Praiseworthy. You ain't exactly dressed for prospecting yourself. You and your boy will be needing a tent and a mountain canary. A mountain canary, Praiseworthy asked. Mule or burro? There goes one. Hee-haw now. Got a fine singing voice, don't he? What's that umbrella for? A matter of habit. Well, it ain't going to rain around here for some time, but seeing how, is that, how I punctured your gold pan, I don't see any reason why an umbrella won't work just as well. Let me show you. But Pitch Pine Billy lifted it off Praiseworthy's arm and opened the umbrella wide. He stuck it in the ground upside down. If you don't mind, sir, said Praiseworthy with a flash of impatience, I happen to treasure that. Yes, sir, the miner was saying to himself, it ought to work fine, just fine. Then he began shoveling dirt into the open umbrella. Praiseworthy watched with a kind of quiet horror. He'd carry that umbrella for years, and now it was being ruined before his eyes. Oh, thank you, sir. But by then, Pitch Pine Billy had lifted the dirt-filled umbrella into the water and was dunking it. He began to twirl it by the handle. He dunked and twirled and twirled and dunked. Why, I've panned gold in a pocket handkerchief, said the miner said. The dirt dissolves and washes through and leaves the spangles behind. Jack, meanwhile, was working the slickens out of his pan. He'd step out of the water to warm his feet and take a sip of coffee and then return. He worked two pans of dirt without finding a speck of color, and then he didn't have the hang of it. He was losing the gold with the slickens, but he stayed with it, and his feet turned blue. Finally, Pitch Pine Billy was no longer plunging the umbrella, but working with a deft, gentle washing movement. He fingered out the rocks, and after another moment, he returned the umbrella to Praiseworthy. Best gold pan along the river, he grinned. I might buy me one of these myself. The mud was gone. In its place along the black fabric of the umbrella lay a bright dusting of gold and spangles. Praiseworthy crimped an eye and smiled at the hospitable manor, miner. I think I can get the hang of it, sir. He removed his shoes, rolled up his trousers, and set to work. All through the afternoon, Jack could be seen panning and taking a sip of cold coffee, and Praiseworthy cut an elegant figure, plunging a muddy umbrella in the stream. Finally, Jack reached the bottom of the tin can, and that was that. Yes, sir, first-rate coffee, Pitch Pine Billy, he said. First-rate. Glad you like it, answered the miner with a bushy-faced grin. Jamoka Jack.